right, as you're doing that, I would like to introduce our next speaker. This is his first time on stage, speaking of dueling mathematicians. Okay. Hello. <clears throat> I am Erling. Um, even though this is my first time here, it is not my first mathematics lecture. When I was in high school, and yes, that is me. <clears throat> I, um, I ran a lunchtime mathematics lecture series. It was lightly attended. And um, there was a rumor that some of the people who showed up were wearing Star Trek uniforms. <laughs> but um, we all agreed that math was fun. Things like this, the quadratic equation. Yeah. <clears throat> this actually was known in ancient times. It came up quite a bit, uh, dividing land, finances, and so on. And uh, it was solved by many different cultures. The Egyptians here, Babylonians, Persians, Chinese, South Asians, etc. And of course, this version that you all learned in high school. Yeah. So now we zoom forward <clears throat> to Northern Italy and the dawn of the Italian Renaissance. Italy at that point was a set of city-states, uh, dukies and so on, that were lightly uh, knit. And uh, the big issue at that time was the cubic equation. It's just the quadratic equation, but it has a term in the cube of x. And, uh, you know, it pissed people off because they couldn't really figure it out for like a few thousand years. And then uh, in Bologna, this guy, Scipione del Ferro, well, actually, that's not him. It's a handsome Italian actor. I have gotten to play the part. Um, he figured out uh, that you could convert that into what was called the depressed cubic. And that could be solved like so. And uh, if any of you want this tattooed on your butt, I'd be totally happy to help you do that. <laughs> and you'd think he'd tell the world. I mean, this problem had been sitting around for a while. But he didn't. He kept it a secret. And why? Because at that time, math secrets like this were worth money and fame and power. Um, the first code of dueling was actually written in Italy uh, about 100 years before, and it was a big hit. Uh, aristocrats were slaughtering each other, you know, by the thousands. And so it was only a matter of, yes. <laughs> Let's do that now. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so yes, it was only a matter of time that such a fun pastime would be mixed with math, which we've seen is fun. and. Um, and the duels would be uh, set up that where mathematics was the weapon of choice. Uh, these were attended by major crowds, uh, sometimes in the style of debates where you'd hurl mathematical problems at your opponent, um, and where money and society and power, uh, university positions even, were at stake. Um, but Scipione del Ferro did tell one of his students, a trusted student, um, Antonio Maria Fiore. Fiore means flower in Italian, by the way, so... Uh, yeah, I'm using the national flower of Italy. Actually, it's not the right species, but whatever. Um, <laughs> but a few years earlier, in, in Brescia, just up north, was this guy. Uh, when he was 12, the French came through his town and slaughtered like 50,000 people, and they left him for dead, uh, slashing up his face with a saber, um, and left him with a speech impediment. And his friends and family, of course, laughed at this and called him Tartaglia, which means the guy who stutters. Um, but he turned out to be a whiz at mathematics, and he wrote all these books. He translated books from the ancients. He studied the flight of cannonballs, like this big flaming cannonball. Uh, does anyone want to know what that says up top? Yeah. It says, science has no enemy except ignorance. He also figured out a way of uh, raising ships. Um, and he became quite the powerhouse of these mathematics duels. This one here, in fact, is attended by the muse of arithmetic herself. 
and he got a position in Venice. Okay, so back to the rest of the story. Uh, so remember, back in Bologna, there's this guy, Fiore, who's been given this powerful weapon. Um, and so the first thing he does is he decides to challenge Tartaglia, because he's this champion. And uh, the first rule of this uh, math fight club is that um, you have to know, <laughs> sorry, you do, well, you have to know how to solve the problems that you propose to the other person, which makes sense. Um, so he proposes all depressed cubic problems, and Tartaglia comes back with a set of problems of his own. But unfortunately, Tartaglia is actually like a really good mathematician, and Fiore just has this formula he can give, you know, he can use for depressed cubic problems, so it's a total wipeout. Um, and in fact, it's kind of amazing because Tartaglia, you know, this problem had been around for a few thousand years, it may have been solved by this other guy, but he figured it out as well and solved all these problems in like two hours. So, more fame and fortune. But fame, as it says here, is a double-edged sword. And in this case, because it got the attention of this guy. So when you hear the term Renaissance man or person, uh, they're talking about one of these people. Um, early on, uh, he had kind of a wild life. He was uh, illegitimate and his mother tried to abort him. It didn't take. Um, and he lived for a while in great poverty. He was sickly, he was impotent. Uh, he didn't have any friends because he was known to be um, an opinionated asshole. And, um, but then at one point, his career just takes off. He writes like 150 books, mathematics, philosophy, medicine. He wrote four books just on urine. And um, he invents this form of a combination lock like you used to have on your bike. He uh, invents this gimbal thingy. Um, he figures out enough of the laws of probability that he becomes quite a wealthy gambler. And uh, using the laws of probability, he can tell when someone cheats, and he famously slashed one of his opponents in the face. Um, uh, at this point, with all his power and money, he realizes he's actually not impotent anymore, and he uh, gets married and has some children, and he becomes ultra-famous, as you can see, for example, because, you know, you get on a hostage stamp. And he sets himself up in Milan. So when he hears about Tartaglia's big win, he actually writes him, and, because, uh, and he says, I know this guy, he's the Spanish Viceroy of Milan, and uh, he's thinking about putting a, uh, giving some mathematics pensions, and so maybe you want to come and, and check that out. Um, but what he really wants, of course, is he just wants to know about the solution of the cubic, because he's writing this book on algebra, and he's got to have it in there. But Tartaglia shows up and says, uh, so what about this money? And Cardano says, yeah, we'll talk about that. But first, you know, what about that cubic thing? And Tartaglia says, well, what about that money? But, and this goes back and forth. But eventually, Tartaglia gives in and says, OK, I'll tell you. But, and I quote, you have to swear a most solemn oath by the sacred gospels, and your word as a gentleman, never to publish the method, and to pledge by your Christian faith to put it down in cipher so that it would be unintelligible to anyone after your death. To this, Cardano says, yep. <laughs> sure. And so Tartaglia gives it to him. But not like this. He gives it to him in a poem. Yeah. It's actually in the same rhyme scheme as uh, the Divine Comedy. Uh, he puts a mistake in it, maybe to try to obfuscate it, but Cardano figures that out and finally wrests that from him. So, this is the situation. Tartaglia's fame, current fame, is based on this. Uh, and Cardano has basically tricked him into giving it to him. But he's promised, you know, to never, ever, ever, ever reveal it. So. <laughs> Cardano has a student, Lodovico Ferrari, pictured here, <laughs> who is in Bologna, and he's chatting with the son-in-law of uh, Del Ferro. Del Ferro, as you remember, is the original guy who solved the cubic. And he says, you know, Del Ferro figured this all out a long time ago, and he gave it, you know, to his student. And Fiore, that's why Fiore challenged Tartaglia. So uh, he races back <laughs> to uh, Cardano and tells him. And Cardano says, well, hey, I guess that very solemn and sacred oath I gave uh, really doesn't matter anymore. And so he publishes it in his very gigantic tome, the Ars Magna, 
which goes on to become the most important mathematical treatise of the 16th century. And even better, that formula gets to be known as Cardano's formula. So, at that point, one might say, without exaggeration, that all hell breaks loose. <laughs> you know, nowadays, Tartaglia would have just called a reporter at the New Yorker and said, Cardano sucks his own cock. <laughs> but, you know, that wasn't available back then. So, instead, he published this huge work in which he uh, called Cardano you know, dishonest, told him he, he broke this vow, has every single conversation they have transcribed, all the letters, etc. Um, but Cardano is like a famous guy at this point. So he just says, ho hum, you little guy, I don't care. And he staffs it out to Ferrari. He says, you, guys, you take care of this. So Ferrari writes him a letter, another quote, says, hold it. You have written things which falsely and unworthily slander Signor Cardano, compared to whom you are hardly worth mentioning. And this goes back and forth. Well, actually, um, there were six challenges and six responses, which were pages and pages of single-spaced insults, reminders of broken oaths, challenges in Latin, in Italian, so on and on and on, and with long lists of basically every important person in all of northern Italy, every city, to whom copies should go. Tartaglia wants Cardano, of course, because he's the guy. But uh, after like a year and a half of this, he finally relents and says, I'm going to sweep the floor with this little puke. I've been offered this job, this better job, and this would be a perfect opportunity for me to show off, because he's the star. He's going to win. Leading us to the great duel of 1548. Tartaglia leaves for Milan. Uh, the contest takes place in the church of Santa Maria del Giordano on the 10th of August. The place is packed with curious Milanese. The governor himself is there. Uh, actually, I have some pictures. This is the band arriving. <laughs> These are some of the good citizens in their Renaissance garb. <laughs> and so we're off. <laughs> Accounts at the time are rather sparse. No one knows what the problems actually were. And in fact, they say that Tartaglia at one point just started screaming invectives and shouting really loud. Um, and Ferrari, you know, he's looking pretty good. And he's got home field advantage. And actually, he wins. And Tartaglia has to, has to leave the city. Uh, Ferrari gets all the glory. Um, Tartaglia's job offer is actually rescinded. And uh, he goes off and writes a book about what shitholes everyone in Milan is. <laughs> so what about Cardano? Well, he doesn't even show up. He's like on vacation that day. He just takes off. But karmically, things don't work out so well for Cardano after that. Uh, one of his sons, who murdered his wife, is, uh, has his hands cut off and is tortured and beheaded. Because um, they couldn't raise enough money to get him off. You know, that's something you could do back then. Um, and his other son uh, gambles away all his money and steals Cardano's money. And, and then at some point, Cardano is arrested by the Inquisition maybe for publishing this horoscope of Jesus Christ, maybe for writing this very, uh, this book about the Emperor Nero and what a great guy he was. You know, he's the guy who like poured pitch down the Christians' throats and lit them on fire. But eventually, mathematicians decide that real duels are a lot more fun. Like, for example, Tycho Brahe, who's been discussed here before, who fought a sword duel in the dark, actually over a mathematical issue, and uh, lost his nose, and it had to be replaced with one of silver. Um, and then the very famous Everest Galois, who everyone should know, who at the age of 20 actually solved the whole big problem, figured out that you could never solve the quintic or above. And uh, he wrote this to a friend in a letter the night before he was in this duel. which he lost. <laughs> so uh, let's end with a quote from this original book of Italian dueling codes, 
none bears a more ardent heart than me, a lion, and I challenge anyone to battle. And raise a glass to all these mathematicians who really knew how to make math fun. <laughs>